Sometimes beauty is a curse on this world. It keeps us from seeing who the real monsters are. The words of a fictional serial killer could not have been more true in what's become known as one of Germany's most twisted and vicious crimes. Behind eyes that seduced and a come-hither smile lay a twisted personality intent on destroying another for selfish gain. It was a homicide like no other, something one would only find between the pages of a good thriller novel or on the silver screen of Hollywood. For one person, it was a crime committed in an act of desperation. For the victim, it was simply trusting and believing in the goodness of others. But what possessed the killer to commit such a brutal and senseless murder? Today, we take a look into a case with an insane twist that will leave you questioning the reason behind the act. Ingolstadt is the second largest German city on the Danube River. Its skyline is dominated by Gothic air architecture that can transport one back to the medieval ages. It's no wonder that the city inspired one of the settings in Mary Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, and is also believed to be the city where the free-thinking Illuminati or was founded in 1776. Today though, the grand beauty of the city has been overshadowed by a murder so vicious one has to hear the entire sordid tale to believe it. Close to midnight on August 16, 2022, the Bavarian police received a frantic call from the parents of German beauty blogger, Shara Banke. She told her parents that she was traveling to Munich to meet with her husband. When she failed to return home and failed to answer or return any of their calls, her parents feared for her safety and set out to look for her themselves. They discovered her Mercedes abandoned in a residential parking lot near the Danube River. In the back seat was a body. Police arrived and cordoned off the area as her parents stood back watching the unreal scene unfold. Police opened the door to reveal a gruesome sight. It was the body of a young woman who had been stabbed so severely. Her face had been disfigured. Blood had soaked into the seats and carpet of the car. Once the body was removed, paramedics attempted to resuscitate the young woman but it was far too late. Sherubin's parents were able to identify her. Although they could not make out her features due to the violence of the stabbing, her dark hair and physique were unmistakable. A quick check of the number plates confirmed the identity of the victim. Police released a statement telling the press that a young woman had been found murdered, and it appeared to be a violent crime. The German press released her first name only as is customary with German law procedure regarding a homicide investigation alongside with a picture of Sherabanke. According to reports, 23-year-old Sherabanke lived with her parents in the Bavarian capital of Munich. She is of German-Iraqi descent, and as stated in media reports had previously been married. According to media outlets, Sherry Ban is a beautician by trade and often blogged about her work. German authorities did not divulge too much of her personal life to the media. But it's alleged that she spent much of her time on social media. Investigators at the crime scene allegedly discovered several knives none of which were the actual weapon used. They also realized that the murder had taken place somewhere else, and the body had been dumped in the back seat of the car was abandoned in the parking lot. Investigators searched the surrounding wooded area for clues, but nothing was found not even the murder weapon. An autopsy was performed on the young woman, and it was revealed that she'd been stabbed a total of 50 times. There were no other injuries to her body, and she'd not been assaulted. Although her parents had already identified her, the investigators required a more concrete result. Blood samples and fingerprints were taken for DNA testing and identification. Within two days, the results were back. Police were preparing to begin investigations into who could have wanted Sharab and dead as they began to look through the autopsy reports. However, in a shocking turn of events, investigators discovered that nothing was what it seemed to be. The twist in this case was so unexpected and surreal that it left everyone speechless. The body was not that of Sherry Ban. Her parents, although relieved, were even more confused. For both them and the investigators, the question was obvious. Who was this girl and how was she related to Sherry Ban? The victim was identified as 23-year-old Khadija O. She was Nigerian-born beauty blogger who lived in Haubran over 100 miles from Munich. 
investigators have not revealed much about her personal life. What is known is that she used social media platforms as a means to promote herself in the beauty industry and create a fan following for her beauty blog. With this mind-boggling discovery, the entire line of investigation had changed. Police were now looking at Sherry Ban as a possible respect in Khadija's murder. The police said released a statement about the missing woman on August 16, 2022, and they received several tips and reports about a woman who was seen in and around Ingelstad who shared an uncanny resemblance to the murdered woman. These were brushed off as rumors initially, but once the DNA report proved that it was not Sherry Ban who'd been murdered, they began looking into these sightings closely. Sherabin had been caught on CCTV footage on August 17, 2022 the day after the body was found at a local pizzeria. After viewing the footage, police questioned the staff and owner and discovered that she'd been seen with a man in the days following the discovery of Khadija's body. They also learned that the man was a local. More interviews with witnesses led them to the apartment of Shakir K, a 23-year-old Kosovian national living in Indad, and the alleged lover of Sherabin. As it happened, the crime scene was not very far from the apartment complex of Shakir. Investigators tracked Shakir to his apartment, and there they found both him and Sherry Ban and arrested them on August 19, 2022. The couple were questioned by investigators regarding their involvement in the merger of Khadija. By then, Investigators had already followed up on Khadija's online profile and discovered that she befriended Cherubane on Instagram back in the summer of 2022. There had been numerous chats between the two women, but what was of particular interest to the police was Sherbin's constant request to meet in person and the uncanny resemblance between both women. Investigators then began looking into Sherbin's online profile. A team of digital forensic analysts were able to match her and several fake accounts on various social media platforms. It became clear that Sherabane and her partner Shakir had been scouring the internet trying to find lookalikes. They had allegedly made contact with five different women, all of whom rejected their request to meet in person. Investigators questioned the couple over a period of time, and they remained in custody from August 20, 22. In January 20, 23, police finally revealed to German newspaper the bill that Cherubin was looking for a doppelganger to use in a fake murder plot. According to reports, Cherubin had been going through a difficult patch with her family and was desperate to find a way out. She intended to go into hiding and find a lookalike who she could use to fake her own death so her family would not search for her. Investigators described her actions as selfish and morally depraved. Khadija had been the unlucky woman who fell for Sherabin's deception. According to police, Sherabin allegedly posed as the German rapper Loon and invited Khadija to star in an upcoming music video. Uncertain about the invitation, Khadija was able to make contact with the rapper and left a voice message that said, I hope you can see it and answer me I'm very, very unsure. It would be really cool if you could tell me if it's real or fake. The rapper responded telling Khadija it's fake sister. Don't answer. When this failed, Sherabane made Khadija an offer she couldn't refuse. A set of beauty products she was known for using often. Investigators then put together all the puzzle pieces and developed a theory of how the couple lured Khadija to her death. Sherabane lied to her parents about having to meet with her ex-husband. Then she left home on the morning of August 16, 2022 and met with Shakur and Ingelstadt. From there, the two drove to Khadija's home in Heilbronn. Afterwards, they all drove back to Ingelstadt, but stopped a few miles away in a forested area where they lured Khadija out of the car before stabbing her over 50 times. They paid particular attention to her face in order to disfigure Khadija, hoping she wouldn't be so easily recognized. After stabbing her to death, they pushed her body into the back seat of the car and drove back to Ingolstadt. They abandoned the vehicle in a parking lot near the residential area hoping it would be found and that their plan could finally go ahead unbeknownst to them. Investigators look for more than just facial features to identify a victim of homicide. After almost five months of being kept in custody on suspicion of homicide, 
without bail. Sherabane and Shaka were served warrants of arrest on January 26 and 27, 2023, respectively, and were charged with first-degree murder in the death of Khadija O. The couple both celebrated their 24th birthdays behind bars and if found guilty, would likely be celebrating their remaining birthdays in prison. Police spokesperson, Andreas Sachlet, said the burden of proof was overwhelming. The murder weapon has still not been found, but the burden of proof is overwhelming. The victim was killed with more than 50 stab wounds and her face was badly injured. This was brutal to the extreme, he said. Ashley added that it was a case that required skill as it wasn't normal in any sense. It was an extraordinary case that required all the investigator skills. We don't have a case like this every day, especially with such a spectacular twist. On the day we found the body, we did not expect it to develop like this, he said. For Sherbin's parents, their relief of discovering their daughter alive was short-lived once they realized the selfish and depraved motive for taking an innocent life. Following the news of the murder, rapper Loon released a message to her fans. Khadija was contacted again with a lure attempt. This time it worked because she believed in the good in people. Today's case not only highlights the dangers of social media but also that evil can hide behind a beautiful face. It also serves as a reminder to anyone who uses social media to always be on their guard and be wary of making friends online. So what are your thoughts on today's case? What could have driven Sherry Ben to take such extreme action to escape her family? What do you think made Khadija believe that Sherban wasn't harmful? Have you been in a similar situation that seemed full of red flags? Let us know in the comment section below. On December 15, 1997, Luzeda Cavas and Pedro Veri's Philadelphia home caught fire. Although the couple's two older children were rescued that day, their 10-day-old baby girl, Deli Marque Vascular wasn't so lucky. Could the fire that engulfed their home be part of a sinister plot or was it an accident? Luzeda Cuevas, who went by Luz, was born in 1971. She is of Hispanic descent and moved to the USA when she was young. Though we don't know the actual year she arrived, we do know that she struggled to adjust and learn the language. Luz started working at a young age. After meeting Pedro Vera, she quickly fell in love. It didn't take long for the pair to get married and have kids. When Luz was in her early 20s, the couple welcomed their first child a boy. Luz had another son a few years later. However, having a daughter was something that she always wanted. She became pregnant once more at the age of 26. And this time, she was carrying a girl. She was ecstatic. In 1997 on December 5th, her baby was due for delivery. Everything went smoothly after the delivery. And a few weeks later, Luz and her newborn daughter were back at their Feltonville home in North Philadelphia. Lou had already thought of the name she would give her newborn girl Deli Marquevis Vera. She was now the proud mother of a little girl. Even though Deli Mar was Luz's third child, she was her first daughter, and it was an extremely happy time in the household. It was also almost time for Christmas, so the family took this opportunity to host a small party at their Philadelphia home. Ten days later on December 15, 1997, Luz and her family held a gathering where she invited close friends and family members. As the evening of December 15, 1997 passed, everything seemed normal. Luz managed to get baby Delimar down to sleep and had placed her in her crib in the front upstairs bedroom of the family's two-story row house. She then went downstairs to take care of a few household chores. Caroline Correa, Pedro's distant cousin, was still around because the brakes on our car were broken. So Pedro decided to fix the car's broken brakes for her. The task took longer than usual, so Caroline went back inside the house. Carolyn found Luz and the two started chit-chatting. Lou had some chores to finish, but she's still engaged in the conversation since they only occasionally met and had a lot to catch up on. As the conversation progressed, Louis came to know about Carolyn's recently born child. Louis was very excited about this news. 
She further wanted to continue this conversation, but it was interrupted with a loud noise that seemed to have come from the second floor of the house at about 7 p.m. Thick smoke started to spread around the house. As the smoke reached down the stairs to where Luz and Carolyn were, it quickly became clear that the house was on fire. Luke then managed to get her two sons out of the house, while Carolyn ran out to call Pedro for help. Immediately, Luis's attention turned to her baby who was still in the upstairs bedroom. Luz quickly rang up the stairs and into the upstairs hallway where she was met with a dense cloud of smoke. To her horror, she realized that the smoke was coming from Delamar's room, which was now almost completely engulfed in flames. Luz managed to make it as far through the flames as she could, but she soon had to turn back as the smoke overwhelmed her. With number one to help her, she ran to the middle of the street and started screaming for help. Soon, nearby residents came to her aid. When she told them that her baby was still inside, one of the neighbor's sons hurried to the house, but the smoke and flames were too much for him to handle, so he turned away. Luckily, the fire response was quick and the fire was put out in under 15 minutes. However, the second floor of Luz and Pedro's home sustained significant damage with Delamar's room being completely destroyed. When the firefighters went into baby Delamar's room, they couldn't find her. The firefighters then broke the news to Luz and Pedro that the 10-day-old baby Delamar was nowhere to be found. As you might guess, when Luz heard this news, she completely broke down and started telling the firefighters that this wasn't possible. Luz was certain that she couldn't find Delamar in her crib when she went upstairs. She was in complete shock. She burned her face and breathed smoke, and the firefighters could see that. They thought that because of the trauma and the injuries, she was just unable to process what had just happened. The horrific incident left Luz and her family in shock. An investigation into the matter was quickly conducted. During the investigation, they recovered debris particles in the burned-out room that resembled human ashes but what had instigated the fire that cost the child's life? The fire was simply a tragic accident. It appeared that the blaze had started because of a dangerously home-wrecked extension cord that had been connected to a space heater. After the investigation was done, the case of the death of 10-day-old Delmar Cuevas Vera was closed. However, the story did not end here. It was evident that Luz and her family went through a great deal of pain. Losing their only daughter just days before Christmas felt like a curse to the family. And although the rest of the family accepted the conclusion of the case, Luz remained convinced that Delamar was still alive as no real evidence of her tiny body ever discovered. The family never held a funeral for baby Delamar. They also never claimed a death certificate because they were afraid to obtain one from the courts because a body was never found. As the years went by, Luz consistently declared that her baby was still alive. Eventually, the matter got so heated that it drove a wedge between her and her family. Soon her husband Pedro filed for divorce, it almost seemed like Luz was becoming insane. But why was Luz so determined that her daughter was still alive? Did she have evidence for her claims? In another interview, Les stated that on the day her house caught fire, she did go into her baby's room, but the crib was empty. In addition to this, she saw that the bedroom window was open. She wanted answers to her questions. She wanted to know why her baby's crib was empty when she ran through the smoke to get her child out. Why was the bedroom window open when it was a freezing cold night outside? And lastly, why were there no remains at all? With all these questions in mind, she wanted to have the matter investigated by the police. But owing to the fact that the whole legal procedure would be above her earnings she did not go ahead with it. But even then, Luz remained determined that one day, she'd be able to reunite with her daughter. On January 20th, 4th, 2004, Luz was invited to a family birthday party in Philadelphia. This birthday celebration was attended by a number of extended family members. Luz was familiarizing herself with the crowd when the unexpected happened. At the party, she noticed a young girl who was about six years old. The longer she stared at the little girl, the faster she came to the realization that this child looked identical to her daughter. 
Delamar. It had been six years since the fateful night that led to her daughter's demise. However, coincidentally, the girl she noticed was about the same size and age as her daughter. However, this wasn't the most intriguing part. The young girl's uncanny resemblance to Luz was so intriguing that Luz wanted to know who she was. Also, when the girl smiled, she noticed the dimple on one of her cheeks that looked exactly like one of her son's. Liz then went around asking who the child was. One of the attendees said that her name was Aaliyah Hernandez, Carolyn's daughter. At that moment, everything turned blank. This was it. Could it be that the daughter whom everyone thought died in the fire on December 15, 1997 was alive this whole time? It couldn't be. She was certain that Aaliyah was her daughter Delamar after recalling the events of that fateful night. Additionally, to seal the proof, Carolyn was in fact there the night her house burned down. Despite being convinced that the girl at the party was Delamar, Liz knew that she had to get evidence, or number one would believe her. According to media reports at the time, she picked up the trick from cop shows. Knowing that to prove this feeling in her gut, she would have to get a DNA sample. This was when she decided to take a big risk Liz called the girl over to her and told her that she had gum stuck in her hair. Under the guise of removing the gum, Liz managed to yank a few of Aaliyah's hairs before stuffing them into a napkin. She then tucked the napkin into a Ziploc bag and soon after, left the party. Although Luz now had what she believed was conclusive evidence that she'd been right about her daughter all along, she knew that the hairs were useless unless you could convince someone to test them. Liz then showed up at the police station with this bag of hair. But the police didn't really take what she was saying seriously. And since they didn't really believe her, they certainly didn't run any DNA tests. The case of their house fire was long since closed, and it was assumed that Delamar was deceased. There was no reason to run a DNA test against this girl's hair. But why? They could have just run a test to be sure. Right. Well, when the police asked Carolyn to produce a birth certificate for her daughter, Leah, she did doubt IT even had a birth date, which stated that the girl was born on January 6, 1998, in a home birth. So despite Luz's claims that the girl was hers, the police didn't want to take the investigation further. No matter how hard Liz pushed the police to do the testing because she knew that it was her baby, they wouldn't pursue it any further. Determined to prove her case, she turned to a local politician, Pennsylvania State Representative Al Hale Cruz, for help, hoping that he would hear her out. During an hour and a half long appointment at Cruz's office, Luz pleaded her case telling him about her six-year-long journey to find her daughter and her theory that Delamar had been kidnapped. Ojo Cruz found it hard to take the information in. He was skeptical. But something inside made him think that this bizarre tale could have some foundation in truth. He found Lewis credible and believed her. He passed the information he'd been given along with the hair evidence to the district attorney's office, which opened an investigation. Two weeks into the investigation, the DNA test results arrived, and it turned out that Luz was right the whole time. The DNA tests proved that the girl she had seen at the party, Aaliyah, was, in fact, Liz's presumed deceased daughter, Delamar, who is now six years old. And just as she had always suspected, the baby who was supposed to have died in the fire age just 10 days, had been alive all this time. Cruz then called the police and Carolyn was given a DNA test that showed that Aaliyah Hernandez was indeed Delamar. When Korea arrived, Aaliyah was taken away from her. It had already been proved that Aaliyah was actually baby Delamar all along but the question was raised, why did Carolyn do such a thing? And if she kidnapped baby Delamar, how could she have managed to pull off such a stunt? Carolyn Correa had a history of difficult pregnancies and losing children. Despite these miscarriages, Carolyn had three children. Her first two children were healthy sons, and her youngest was a daughter. But despite having three children already, she kidnapped Delamar when she was just 10 days old. If she had wanted a baby girl all along, why would she kidnap Delomar in the first place? According to the records, 
Carolyn did actually give birth to a baby in her home just three days before the fire took place at Liz's home in Philadelphia. However, we don't know what really happened to that baby. At that time, Carolyn was with her boyfriend and according to him, he believed that she was pregnant with a girl and that he was the father of the child. A close friend of Carolyn also confirmed that she assisted Carolyn with her home birth. Either way, when Carolyn heard the news that she was not Aaliyah's biological mother, she was shocked. Additionally, she also refused to believe that Aaliyah was actually Delamar, who was Luz and Petro's daughter. The investigation into the matter quickly resumed, and it turned out that Carolyn had used her car troubles on the night of December 15, 1997 as a ruse to make her way into Luz and Pedro's house after the party had dispersed. Once she entered, she waited until Luz was distracted before she finally went up and stole the newborn from her crib and started the fire to cover her tracks. Carolyn then took the baby girl across state lines to her home in Willenboro, New Jersey, where she claimed just days later that she'd given birth to the girl inside her house. She then renamed the girl, Alia Hernandez, and for the next six years, she raised the child as her own. Carolyn sent Aaliyah to a private school and enrolled her in a beauty pageant training. Until she met Les on January 24, 2004. As investigators further looked into Carolyn's background, they found something completely shocking. This incident was not the first time that she'd been in trouble with the law. In fact, a year after the kidnapping, she'd been convicted in connection with the 1996 theft and fraud case after it was discovered that she'd been stealing business checks from the medical office she worked for. Interestingly, in that case, she had also used arson to try to cover her tracks setting fire to the medical office to hide evidence. Thankfully, number one was hurt, but Carolyn received a five-year probation for the crime. Carolyn was charged with kidnapping arson, assault, concealing the whereabouts of a child, and interfering with the custody of a child. She was taken into custody on $1 million bail. However, there were many questions that remained unanswered. These questions were how could she have made her friends and relatives believe her story for so many years? And since she was Pedro's cousin, didn't the father recognize his own child? Though we don't really know for sure, there was one thing that was certain. Carolyn couldn't have pulled off the kidnapping alone she might have had an accomplice. The case soon went to trial, but things got really messy. Carolyn accused Delamar's father Pedro of being in on the whole kidnapping plan. There were even rumors and allegations that Pedro was actually having a romantic relationship with his cousin Carolyn, and the plan was for the three of them to be a family. Though all of this was just speculation and none of it was proven, the judge confirmed that there was a high chance that a second person was involved but no evidence was found. Later, her lawyer ruled the case as insanity to her defense, but despite this, Caroline was sentenced to 9 to 30 years in prison in 2005 with the eligibility for parole in 2014. What were your thoughts on this crazy case? Do you believe that no force is more powerful than a mother's intuition? Please share your opinions about this in the comments section below. For 55-year-old Kenneth, Kenny, Kuntz, July 5th was shaping up to be another ordinary day. He hopped out of the trailer next to his family's home and went to the house to greet them. As he entered, he was met with a grisly scene. His entire family had been shot dead and left to bleed out on the floor. Kenneth was horrified by what he discovered and ran to the nearest phone to call the police. In the coming weeks, investigators would struggle to find the culprit, leaving the community wondering who would kill this tight-knit family and why were they targeted. The town of Bern, Wisconsin, sits in the middle of the state and is part of the Wausau metropolitan area. As of the year 2000, only 562 people called Bern home. The town boasts a population density of 16.5 people per square mile, and many families in Bern have the luxury of living on multi-acre properties. There's an abundance of parks, golf courses, and national parks making Bern an ideal quiet town for those looking to raise a family. At least that's what the Coons family, who called this home, had once believed. 
The Coons family consisted of 70-year-old Helen Coons, her son's 55-year-old Kenneth and 30-year-old Randy Coons, and Helen's siblings, 78-year-old Clarence Coons, 81-year-old Irene Coons, and 72-year-old Marie Coons. The family were known in the community as being extraordinarily close-knit. Some even regarded them as being too close. The family resided in a dilapidated gray house on a 108-acre plot of land six miles from Burntown Center. Those who had visited the family home and farm described it as cluttered and littered with items. The house had no indoor plumbing, and the family relied on a wood-burning stove to cook with and keep themselves warm. All but one of the Kuntzes, Kenneth, lived in the cluttered home. Kenneth had chosen to live in a trailer next to the house in a bid to gain some privacy. Despite the rundown appearance of the Coons home, they were somewhat wealthy. Between them, they had managed to store over $20,000 in cash around the house. The Coonses were thought to be a bit odd. They always paid their bills with cash and preferred to keep to themselves. The family mostly wore hand-me-down clothes passed from one family member to another and seemed to be exceedingly close. Kenneth and Randy would often drive their mother, Helen, into town so she could buy food and pay the bills. According to a Post Crescent article, the Kuntzes were treated like strangers in their own town. Some residents took a kinder approach to the Kuntzes, but most residents regarded them as eccentric and bizarre. The Kuntzes would have faded into obscurity had it not been for a breezy July 4th evening. On July 5th, 1987, Kenneth awoke in his trailer clutching his head. He'd spent the night visiting the cheese factory where he'd worked before going out for drinks with friends. With it being July 4th, Kenneth had downed a few extra beers and joined in with the celebrations. A fact he regretted when he awoke the next morning. After dressing himself and getting ready for the day ahead, Kenneth gingerly walked out of his trailer and headed to the main home. He expected to be greeted by his mother, uncle, and aunts, but instead, he'd be met with a scene that would haunt him forever. As the front door hinges creak, Kenneth shouted out to his mother, but there was no response. He closed the door behind him and continued to shout for her. He froze in horror when he took a few more steps down the entryway. His Aunt Marie lay motionless on the floor in a pool of her own blood, and she'd been shot with a twenty-two caliber gun to the head. Kenneth moved around the home in a daze, hoping that this some sort of nightmare he would wake from soon. When he got to the kitchen, he found that Randy had been shot and left to die in a pool of blood. Kenneth rushed over to him and tried to resuscitate him, but it was too late. Kenneth now knew he had to find the rest of his family members, and he began cautiously moving from room to room. At this point, Kenneth was unsure whether the perpetrator was still inside the home, and he feared that he might suffer a similar fate. Upon reaching the bedrooms of Clarence and Irene, he discovered both of their bodies. They too had been shot with a 22 caliber gun. Clarence was in his bedroom, while Irene had been found slumped in a chair. It was clear to Kenneth that this had been a surprise attack, and his family had not had time to react or flee. A sickly feeling washed over Kenneth as he ran downstairs and out of the door. He ran to the nearest neighbor's house banging on their front door. When someone finally opened the door, a jumble of words escaped Kenneth's mouth as he tried to ask to use their phone. Panic and fear had hijacked Kenneth's body, and adrenaline was pumping through his veins. Finally, he was able to communicate with his neighbor, and a 911 call was placed. Within minutes, squad cars with flashing lights and blaring sirens had swarmed the humble 108-acre Coons farm. Investigators briefed themselves on the situation at hand, and the investigation was officially opened. Kenneth was the first person that the Marathon County Sheriff's Office wanted to speak to. After all, he had been the one to discover his family's bodies and the only one in the family who hadn't been harmed. During their initial interviews, Kenneth mentioned that his mother, Alan Kuntz, was nowhere to be found in the home. While Kenneth was concerned for his mother's well-being, investigators couldn't help but be suspicious. In the early hours of the investigation, a motive had not yet been established, 
and investigators were willing to explore all avenues. According to an article written by UPI in July 1987, the Marathon County investigators say they will not know if Helen Coons is a victim or suspect until she's found. Would Helen really have the motive to kill her entire family and spare only her one son? Is it possible that she took her life afterward? Could she have gone on the run with a new identity? These burning questions were placed on the back burner while investigators desperately scrambled to decipher what had happened that evening of July 4th. Crime scene investigators painstakingly combed through the Coons' home. Their reports described how the home was filled with trash and debris and had no modern amenities such as plumbing or a proper kitchen. The family lived in squalor, never throwing anything away and letting dirt accumulate around the home. This struck investigators as bizarre. Not only did the family have a farm that provided a solid income, but over $20,000 in cash was found stashed around the home. Adjusted for inflation, $20,000 would be over $52,000 today. While the family lived in what could be described as poverty and squalor, they owned a TV and a video player. A rumor spread around the town like wildfire, which had only ostracized the family more. Gail Weiler, the owner of a local hardware store, confessed to the Marathon County investigators that in the weeks before the shooting, Helen had come into the store and purchased some 22 caliber bullets. Helen claimed that the ammunition was used by her sons, Randy and Keith, to shoot birds on the family's sprawling property. But that wasn't the most interesting clue that she divulged. Gail told investigators that Helen had complained about her family watching dirty movies together on the video player. This was backed up by the library of obscene material discovered in the Kuntz family home. Disturbingly, this was not the first time that rumors of deviant sexual behavior and incest had swirled around the family. Marathon County investigators uncovered a case file from the 1930s where a 40-year-old neighbor stood accused of attacking and pregnant a then 15-year-old Helen and was found guilty by the court. Not only this, but Kenneth also believed that his biological father was Helen's brother, Clarence Coons. The truth of these claims is unclear, but the family, especially Helen's mother, had always denied it. With the rumor mill swirling, more gossip came to light throughout the years. The people of Bern believed that Helen and her son Randy shared a bed at night, further fueling the Kuntz incest rumors. It was also reported that Clarence, Marie, and Irene, who were all siblings, slept together in the living room. The rumors of incest had persisted for generations. And now, townsfolk wondered whether those relationships had come to a head. People continued to speculate. Meanwhile, Helen was still nowhere to be found. The people of Bern stood behind Kenneth Kuntz, even if it was at a slight distance. While the family was odd, and there were rumors of disturbing and disgusting behavior, the townsfolk still felt the pain of the massacre. People came together in the wake of Helen's disappearance and created t-shirts, buttons, and posters that said, Where is Helen? Appeals for information were launched and everyone kept a close eye out for any sign of her. Investigators knew that Helen had last been seen at a fireworks display in Athens, Wisconsin on July 4, 1987, a day before the slayings. Kenneth had been at work and then at the bar, so he was unable to shed any light on his mother's disappearance. People began debating whether a 5-foot, 3-inch, 70-year-old woman could be capable of killing her entire family. As summer slowly transitioned into autumn, the thoughts of the Kuntz family floated to the back of people's minds, and the town of Bern returned to normal. Meanwhile, investigators continued their search for Helen and the person responsible for wiping out almost her entire family. But as the mystery thickened, authorities came across a baffling twist. Nine months after the massacre in April 1988, Helen's body was discovered in a marsh in Taylor County. Wisconsin. Like the rest of her family, she'd been shot in the head with a 22 caliber bullet. After discovering the body of Helen, an autopsy was performed, but any additional evidence uncovered has never been released. However, the investigation hit a dead end for a brief period after Helen, the presumed perpetrator, 
ended up having suffered the same fate as the rest of her family. Surprisingly, the 1987 shooting wasn't the first time the Kuhn's family had experienced a tragedy like this. In December 1905, Helen's grandmother, Mary Kuntz, was found murdered in her home in Manitoba, Wisconsin. The investigation was short but ended in a shocking conclusion. Wenzel Kuhn's, Mary's own son, had been charged with her murder. Wenzel had bludgeoned his mother while she lay in bed, leaving her to be discovered by the rest of the family. During his trial, Wenzel was found to be insane and was sent to a mental institution. Coincidentally, his brother was also a patient at the same facility. The Coons family had significantly downsized by 1906. And in 1914, the remaining family members moved to Marathon County to start a new life and settled on a supposedly abundant farm. However, when they got there, they realized that they'd been lied to. The farmland they'd been promised was nothing but a wasteland of tree stumps and organic waste. The Kuntzes eventually made a name for themselves across Bern and Marathon County. But investigators struggled to piece together a motive. Over $20,000 had been discovered in the family home, ruling out robbery as a motive. Then in January 1988, another twist arose in this already puzzling case. Investigators stumbled across new evidence that brought to light a suspect. The man was Christopher Jacobs III of Athens, Wisconsin, just a stone's throw away from Bern. Investigators had discovered that shortly before the murders occurred, 22-year-old Christopher had bought a car from the Kunzes. He was one of a select group of people that had ever interacted with the Kunzes. Many people stayed away from them because they thought they were odd or had heard the rumors, while others never had a chance to interact with them due to their reclusive lifestyle. Investigators found it suspicious that Christopher had interacted with this strange family and began to dig deeper. Upon searching his property in Medford, investigators found a car, two 22 caliber rifles, 22 caliber ammunition, spent shell casings, and newspaper clippings about the Coons' murders. After a forensic examination of the vehicle obtained from Christopher's property, it was believed to have created tire tracks that had been left behind at the Coons crime scene. According to a motion filed to the Wisconsin Court of Appeals, police had taken plaster cast impressions of tire tracks and footprints from the area around the Coons residence in their garden located about a quarter of a mile from the house. In January 1988, detectives sought out Christopher Jacobs's car to see whether its tires could have made the tracks found in the Coons garden. Christopher was arrested in January 1988, and he was released without charge days later. To make matters worse, for months following his release, investigators struggled to collect evidence while he was roaming free without a care in the world. It wasn't until August 1988 that the Marathon County Sheriff's Office knocked at Christopher's door again. He was rearrested and charged again and was informed that the case would be going to trial. Then in August 1988, Jacobs is charged with five counts of party to murder. His arrest started one of Marathon County's longest investigations. 22-year-old Christopher Jacobs III awoke in a prison cell on a warm August morning. It took a while to adjust to his new life of being told when to eat, sleep, and where to go. Throughout the process Christopher maintained his innocence and retained a lawyer. Christopher's defense team knew that the evidence against him was circumstantial. The murder weapon was never found, and the tire tracks in his personal 22 caliber weapon were circumstantial at best. Christopher's lawyers spent months preparing their defense. In October 1989, the trial commenced Cronker Stevenson, a reporter for the Milwaukee Journal had been following the case closely. And when the court dates were made public, he made sure to grab himself a front row seat. He later recalled to the Post Crescent. They put a suit on Christopher and cut his hair. But he was a thug and he came from a family who looked at these people, the Kuntzes, as someone they could victimize. As the town of Bern and the people of Marathon County are exceptionally interconnected, a jury was brought in from neighboring Brown County to ensure that Christopher was given a fair trial. For weeks, 
evidence was presented, witnesses and experts were cross-examined, and the investigation was scrutinized. A lengthy video of the crime scene was shown to the jury. Most of them found its stomach churning and unwatchable as the bodies of the Kuntz family and their wounds were displayed on camera. Tire prints from Christopher's car and the crime scene were shown to the jury, along with testimony that he'd been one of the only people to have interacted with the family. The remaining Kuntz family and their supporters held their breath as the jury delivered their verdict. Christopher Jacobs III was staring down the barrel of a long sentence for a murder of almost an entire family. But in a shocking twist, after just 10 hours of deliberation, the jury found him not guilty on all charges. The courtroom was immediately filled with cries and shouts. Christopher gasped. He was finally free. As to account number five, not guilty of her in the first agreement, I'll tell you. Christopher was released from custody after the October 28, 1989 verdict, but he wouldn't remain a free man for long. In 1993, Christopher's ex-girlfriend Stacy Weiss would once again stoke the flames of this bizarre and twisted case. She visited the Marathon County Sheriff's Office and asked specifically to talk with Lieutenant Randall Heinisch. As Lieutenant Honish clicked play on the tape recorder, he stared in disbelief at Stacy as the words spilled from her mouth. Stacy told Lieutenant Honish that in 1991, she and Christopher had been dating and that he had confessed to murdering the Coons family. When she asked him why he'd done it, Christopher replied, to prove to himself that he was a man. Stacy would say that Christopher arrived at the Coons' home on the evening of July 4, 1987, where Randy Coons greeted him. The two had built a good rapport with each other after Christopher bought a car from Randy, and Randy happily welcomed him into the home. According to Stacy, the two quickly became embroiled in an argument. At which point, Christopher pulled out a 22 caliber gun and shot Randy. Christopher then moved around the home systematically taking out the rest of the family by shooting them at point-blank range in the head. For unknown reasons, Christopher decided to tie up Helen and take her out to the swamp where he shot her and left her body. Christopher was alarmed by this confession from his former girlfriend, telling investigators that she was nothing more than a jilted lover out for revenge. Unfortunately for Christopher, the Marathon County Sheriff's Office took Stacy's word, and Christopher was arrested yet again this time being charged with the kidnapping and murder of Helen Kuntz. It would take five years for Christopher Jacobs III to stand trial, and investigators were glad they'd acted when they did. According to reports, the statute of limitations was due to expire just hours before Christopher was arrested for the second time. On June 8, 1998, Christopher Jacobs III stood in court again awaiting his fate for a second time. Unfortunately, Christopher's luck had run out and after just four hours of deliberation, he was found guilty of kidnapping and falsely imprisoning Helen Kuntz. Christopher Jacobs III was sentenced to serve 31 years in prison with a parole date set for February 2020. On February 4, 2020, the now 53-year-old Christopher Jacobs III was released from the Columbia Correction Institution after being granted parole. In a bizarre twist, Christopher found himself back in custody on February 5th. 2020, at the Marathon County Jail. Strangely, he had ended up back in custody at his own behest telling officers that he had no interest in parole and would rather serve the remainder of his sentence at the Columbia Correction Institution. However, he still claimed to the media that he was innocent and that the police had coerced his former girlfriend, Stacy, into lying about his supposed confession. He told the Wausau Daily Herald Marathon County could be looking to hook me up on bogus charges to justify my false imprisonment. Shortly after my 1989 acquittals on all charges, I was told to get out of Wisconsin because police were going to retaliate. Christopher Jacobs III returned to jail in June 2020, opting to serve 14 months, which was the remainder of his sentence behind bars. Many in Bern do not believe that Christopher killed the Coons family. The prevailing theory is that someone within the family committed the crime. However, with all but one of them now deceased, 
It's unlikely that we'll ever discover the truth. What do you make of this case? Do you think Christopher Jacobs III is guilty or is the actual perpetrator lurking elsewhere? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section.